Hi. Hi, friends. I'm Sean. I'm Bert. This is Past Story, Story Time. And we are going to do our top ten books of the year. It's our favourite time of year. Ooh. We've been loving watching everyone's top tens and end yeah. of year lists. I watch all the movies ones and music ones, uh, and, but the book ones are our favourites. Keep them coming. Yeah. Or let us know if you've done one, yeah. or if you don't have channels that you put on Instagram, or just tell us in Reload the comments. On Instagram. Yeah, yeah, we'd be really interested. Yeah. There's lots of other books which are kind of really interesting. Yeah. Um, that maybe weren't perfect, that yeah. haven't made the list. So we're going to do a separate video yeah. where we're talking about some other stuff that we read I feel there's well. like one or two books which were perfect, which didn't make my list. Yeah. Um, just because I felt like maybe it's very specific to me and maybe they weren't that great. Yeah. Who knows? Or maybe that thing of just like the stuff that's a bit more kind of experimental or a bit more out there, mm. maybe, yeah. These are our top tens. We put, <laughs> them, we put them in order. Yeah. That made me. Yeah. She did it. Yeah. Quickly. Didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who wants to go first? You. Okay. So, uh, number ten on my list is Mary Gates Gill, Lost Cat. Woo! Which is a very small, slim book, which has really stuck with me. Um, I, we already both uh, love Mary Gates Gill. Um, I just love her writing. This is essentially like an extended essay, um, partially about her... Um, adopting a cat, a kitten, when she was on holiday in Italy and um, bringing her back to America with her and then the cat sort of um, disappearing, going missing. Um, but she sort of branches that out into, a, you know, a bit of a study on um, what it means to care for some someone that isn't human or, you know, like that kind of relationship um, and how other people can judge you for those feelings that you have for cats um, uh, when it's sort of seen as like almost like you're being um, hysterical or something like that um, so yeah it's really moving um, really precisely written her writing is just it really is so yeah <laughs> if you sort of think you're going to be reading you know a book about a person that's lost their cat you are but it's, it's like there's loads of other stuff going on as well with her she's so smart and so articulate and yeah number 10 my number 10 is Katie by Malcolm, Michael, Michael McDowell, not Malcolm, not Malcolm McDowell. McDowell. I do that every single <laughs> time. Um, a little bit of these top 10s about uh, books that have stayed with me for every reason. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those. Um, it's horror. Um, it was written in the 80s, I think, 19, 1982. Yeah. But it's actually set in New York in the 1870s so it's like historical um katie is this like horrendous figure who um will just hammer you to death um and swindle you and do anything and then there's another character called philo who's kind of um keeps crossing paths with Katie, they've got some sort of links between them, and you're just the whole way just really rooting for Philo to, you know, be okay mm -hmm. while kind of enjoying yeah. Katie's hideousness. Yeah. Um, so it had like real tension in it for me about is Philo going to be okay? Yeah. Um, there is some dog killing in this. Oh, yeah. I feel that's important to, yeah. important to share. Quite like. Um, whereas I don't particularly like historical in general, yeah. I do like historical genre, so I like yeah. historical kind of horror, horror yeah. or, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, my next one, number nine, favourite books of the year, was uh, Medical Grade Music, which ah. uh, I got out of the library, so it's here. Um, this is by Steve Davis and Kavos Tarabi. I've spoken loads about this if you've watched any of our sort of vlogmas or even previously, because it was one of those books that took me many months to complete. But it was absolute joy throughout. Um, they're just music lovers, and I, I don't think they entirely kind of knew what book they were going to be, end up writing. And it's kind of part of their own sort of memoirs. So um, Steve Davis obviously writing a bit about his like snooker career and what, what kind of music was going on throughout his life. 
and Tavis talking about you know the various bands he'd been in but it's also those musical discoveries they made along the way and how like a friend of theirs said oh you should listen to this band um, and it's all this kind of great obscure uh, music sort of largely 70s 80s uh, you know like underground music experimental music goes of prog um, bands like Magma um, and Can and stuff like that so and and, and they're they, they formed a friendship at a, at a gig where they met each other and they've since sort of gone on to not only sort of record music together which is actually amazing I will I can link one of their tracks below um, uh, but they sort of DJ together so they uh, played sort of Glastonbury DJ there and loads of other festivals um, and it's just a real sort of joyful I think in a year where like we were all kind of looking for a bit of joy I felt this was like a real honest joyful book where they'll just be being themselves, sharing their love for, you know, geekdom and music. And uh, it was kind of infectious. So I, I really loved that. And I kind of really, that makes me feel a scene as well. You know, like I feel I'm not the only person that is obsessive about, you know, what year a certain album came out, <laughs> who plays on it and how it feels to listen to it. Yay. Um, my number nine is, well, number nine and number eight are kind of, I feel, a couple. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Spring by Carlo Vicknausgaard. Um All of my top ten are fiction, apart from this is this is called fiction. Yeah. It's obviously his life, so yeah. it's like that auto fiction yeah. kind of thing. Um, so yeah, Spring. It's part of a series. Um, I haven't really. I've read two of the other ones, or one and a half of the other ones. I don't really like the other books in this series. Mm. Um, his writing is always great, so you know that the writing is going to be amazing, but I guess it's whether it captures you. But this one really captured me. This is like a particular... I think it's mainly just in... Well, yeah, it's one day in April where um, he's with his um, baby daughter, who's you know quite new, <laughs> um, and it's just through one day, and they're going to... The kind of end of the day is that they're going to visit... The baby's mum, his wife, in um, like a, a hospital where she's been, where she is for like mental health um, reasons. So it's kind of, yeah, it, it's very simple, but it kind of goes back and forth, and um, obviously talks about sort of spring things as well. Um, it's just yeah, beautiful writing. It's really tender, really touching. Um, I buddy read this with Jessica. Oh, yeah. We both really liked it. Um, I feel for me, it feels like it's. It works better that you've read all of My Struggle first, but I know that Jessica hadn't read all of them, so mm -hmm. um, it worked for her as well. Yeah. So, But I, I felt like it references lots that's already in My Struggle. So, Yeah. Surprise, surprise, but a K-Guard on the okay guard on Also, the it's um, illustrated by Anya, Anna Berger, and these are really nice um, illustrations or paintings. And it's also got, I know that people care about these things, um, it's also got really beautiful feeling paper. Mm. Very is soft. Is it um, translated? Ooh, it is very well, very well done. It's translated by Ingvild Berkey. Number eight on my list, which I only had like a proof copy of, so I put the official front cover here is uh, Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit, um, which is a really difficult book to talk about. Um, enough to say it's, I felt like the most uh, sort of current feeling book that I read this year. It felt like it um, had lots to say about this moment in Britain specifically. Um, and Alison Rumfit is a trans author. It's, it's, it's largely about her experience as a trans woman, um, sort of navigating relationships and friendships and uh, within a Britain where these kind of fascist political ideas are starting to sort of come back. Um, so essentially it's kind of a social realism novel, but it's also like a kind of supernatural horror novel, if that makes sense. So it's those lots of things mixed up. Um, it uses the kind of the, the, the metaphor and the kind of the very real kind of setting of this house, this haunted house, um, as a sort of scene of trauma and haunting um, and it's just felt, it's really visceral, it, um, it sort of has commentary on, you know, like figures like Morrissey, um, and it just felt really important, visceral, and I just loved it, I just felt it, it's like I was in the world of this kind of, this whole new kind of form um, of novel. I'm not sure if it's travelled beyond the UK that we've uh, cancelled sure. Morrissey. 
Oh yeah, that's true. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if everyone knows yeah. that, but so Morrissey, uh, I think, has always been low key racist in the past, and I, you know, I know people sort of grew up listening to the Smiths and kind of revere them. I love the Smiths. Yeah, yeah. Um, I never really. My brother was really into the Smiths, so that's kind of a big part of my childhood, I guess. But I never really something always about him about him always jarred with me a little bit, and sort of yeah, in recent years, he's said quite a few racist things. Um, he's kind of. I think in his attempt to remain sort of relevant or controversial, I think he's um, alienated a lot of his fan base mm. in the UK, but yeah, maybe less so in other countries where they're maybe not as aware of his sort of TV um, appearances wearing kind of like right wing nationalist kind of uh, badges and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I've, I felt that was a really good perspective to mm. sort of say actually like what he says is harmful to people. Um, and and yeah, yeah. Screw, and, screw Morrissey. Yeah, yeah, I need to read this book. Yeah. I've seen it on other people's top tens as yeah. well. But yeah, also, I don't know if it has tra- the book as well. I don't know if that's gone. No, I'm not sure. So it's, it's on Cypher printed. Press. Yeah. Um, I think, are they Scottish? I'm not Ooh, sure. Not sure. I think they're a UK, they're a UK press. Um, but check it out, definitely, if, if it sounds like something you are in a, a good space for. Because as I said, it's quite harrowing. Um, loads of sort of trigger warnings for um, sexual abuse. Um, verbal anti-trans language um stuff like that so yeah be careful but would recommend my number eight is linda boston Knescott. so when i said it's kind of a couple not really they divorced <laughs> <laughs> so they've divorced now yeah. but this is again it's his novel it's obviously right her life yeah um they they divorced kind of i think this book is... Is it, is it like if you call something a novel, you can't get sued? I feel that that's part of it. <laughs> you think that is I think it, it is part of it. Yeah. yeah. And also, I think as well, because I've read interviews with Carlo Knauskott, he talks about how, um, you know, even though it is his life, he's, he makes up dialogue. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that makes yeah. it, I guess, so it's not true in a sense, no. is it? Yeah, so. that's true. It's translated by Saskia Vogel, who is a translator I just look out for because I think... I don't know how, you know, she makes these choices, but mm. her book, the books that she translates are always really interesting, and I really like her as a writer, anyway, yeah. but her, her, her book. Um, and, yeah, this is about um, Linda um, from 2013 to 17. She was periodically interned in a psychiatric ward where she was subjected to electroconvulsive therapy. Um, so it's about a lot of that, so, you know, quite difficult stuff as well. Um, and is a bit about the relationship with Carla and Kersgaard. Um I went into this like a bit, um, I was a bit unsure because I think a little bit about the way it's portrayed is like Linda's finally getting her say. Oh, and um, yeah, yeah. it's not really like that. That's just an easy way to promote something. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It's like, um, I feel that even though they've, you know, they've obviously, they've broken up anyway, I feel they actually write kind of quite kindly about each other. It's not like, you know, they're quite generous to each yeah. other. I thought it was really great. Beating uh, Carl. To well, the, they're kind of... In your, in your top ten, <laughs> I kind of nice put them with them together. Yeah. I haven't read any other Linda, though. No. Um, she's got novels as well. I'm definitely going to read I, I think they're only just her. kind of really starting to come out over oh, here yeah, now, they, aren't they? Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, great writing. This is very it, typical. Like the female author only sort of comes out after the yeah, male yeah, author yeah. gets discovered. Yeah, um, and Would I like it? I think you'd like it. It sort of felt like something like reading a little bit, reading like The Bell Jar or oh, okay. um, uh, the Susanna Cason, Susanna Cason we read. Yeah. You know, that kind of, a lot, it's a lot set in the mental health uh, facility yeah. or the psychiatric ward, which sounded off, you know, still really bad. Yeah. But, um, great writing, though. Yeah. Number seven. Yay. Uh, Pass With Care. Uh, this is by uh, Cooper Lee Bombardier. And this is, um, it's, well, it says memoirs, but... It's kind of written as, I think, sort of essays that were written throughout many years. Uh, okay. Um, so it wasn't, I guess, intended yeah. as a complete kind of work. Um, so, yeah, it spans um, his time in the sort of 90s San Francisco sort of queer punk community. Led by Michelle T. Yeah. So, yeah. And it mentions uh, the Sister Spit kind of collective, which Michelle T it. was behind. Um, and sort of being um, welcomed within that community as, um, you know, what he says is as a sort of a butch dyke and how they were really embracing of that at that point in time in that specific space and there's a real celebration of that moment 
um, in San Francisco. Um, and then about his transition. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, lots about, um, so I think he's working as a sort of security guard and things like that. And lots about his relationships with, you know, sort of cis men um, in, in that kind of environment of um, his work and stuff like that. And yeah, there's, there's just so much in here. It's about Buddhism um, and it's just a really interesting perspective on being um, part of a particular community and then um, how that shifts when he uh, is, presents himself as what he is a man and how that community then has to kind of readjust how they view him and he has to readjust his perspective on the community. Um, and it's just a great collection of essays, the writing is brilliant, great book. Yay. Um, so is that number seven? So that's number seven for me. So number seven for me is Dangers of Smoking in Bed by Mariana Enriquez, translated from Ooh, the, the I know, from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. Um, uh, Mariana Enriquez is from Buenos Aires. One of the things that I am um, thinking of, of like, what's your favourite books of the year, mm. is like, how much did I Google the authors afterwards? <laughs> it's a very Gemini thing. <laughs> how many interviews did yeah. I watch with them after I read the book? Yeah. And I feel that is... Uh, yeah. So anyway, I did yeah. watch interviews with, with her and kind of... Actually led to another book in your top ten. Yeah. yeah. And I did read her other book of short stories, which I didn't uh, like nearly as much. Yeah. Um, which is a bit I thought I was going to love it more with Things We Lost in the Fire which I buddy read with um, Daniela and yeah. neither of us liked it as much yeah. I thought this was amazing It uh, it's from initially from the 90s I think it does have a couple of instances of kind of um, language around trans people that's kind of a slur um, to see where if, you, if you're interested in reading it um, short stories that are kind of creepy and weird and dark and witchy um, I read one of them. Yeah, so I yeah. made Bert read Meat, which yeah. is one of my favourite short stories, yeah. and you really liked it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite sort of dark, isn't it? And kind of witchy. Yeah. Um, but also very much um, in of its place as well. It felt very much, yeah. of, you know, it's not about the sort of the streets and the surroundings of Buenos Aires. Yeah. It's about the people living on the streets as well. Um, yeah, thought it was great. Loved the cover. Yeah, it's a great cover, isn't it? Mm. Uh, number six, Annihilation by uh, Jeff Vandermeer. Yeah, I was kind of obsessed with this when it, um, <laughs> I was reading it, and I've got book two now, and I still haven't read it. Um, so yeah, this is um, a sort of pretty well-known book, I think it's been really popular, um, and also unpopular with some people. For me, it felt sort of legit, legitimately um, mind-altering. Um, it's about a group of uh, people sent to investigate this um, area called Area X, uh, which many sort of um, previous teams have been to explore and have sort of not really sort of come back or come back changed. Um, I just thought it was brilliant. I thought it was really imaginative, really atmospheric. It sort of really gets under your skin. We watched the movie. The movie was really different and had some not as good bits in it, sort of changes that they'd made. But I actually thought the movie was really great as well. In I its enjoyed own the way. movie. Yeah. I, haven't, yeah, I haven't made the book. Yeah. Um, so some of them my favourite bits in the book weren't in the movie. I mm. particularly sort of liked the, um, the sort of the fungus, how it was like writing letters on the walls. Um, that's That visual, if nothing else from this year, is, is sort of stuck in my brain. Mm. And these little kind of um, fungusy things, writing um, sentences on the walls. Yeah. Um, I think it's sometimes in, kind of better if books and movies are quite different. Because yeah, they're I agree. different. Yeah. yeah, I'd rather an interpretation of a book... Um, like yeah, rather than a straight, getting the feel of copy. it feels yeah. more important. Isn't yeah, it? But I loved it, and I really love this kind of cosmic horror, um, the sort of revival of cosmic horror, that sort of post H.P. Lovecraft type thing, um, and yeah, loved it. So good. My next one. So this is number six. Six. Sasha Masha by Sasha Agnes Varinsky. It's my only young adult book on the list. I'll talk about some young adult ones another time yeah. as well. Gorgeous cover again. This um, just really connected with me, and I felt really moved by it. Mm. Um, and that's why it's in the top ten. I want to read this one too. Yeah, I keep it's, adding it to my piles and not getting into it. Yeah, it's really quick to read. It's really love, beautifully written. I think it's um, it's about um, Alex who tries on a dress and um, becomes Sasha Masha. Oh, okay. 
and it's about Alex trying to find their place. So it's like um, they start dating a girl, and then they, um, I don't know, it's, it's that thing of just like working out, I yeah. guess, where you are yeah. and who all, your yeah, people are. Yeah, what adults for, isn't it? Yeah, and it was so lovely. Yeah. Um, I really loved it, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of joyous as well. There's not necessarily any grief coming from this, yeah. you know, there's like supportive parents, yeah. and there's like... Lots of, I mean, it's not all kind of wonderful, but the, yeah. but, but it's like you know finding a group of people, how yeah. important that is, yeah. and finding kind of clubs and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I thought it was wonderful. And blurb by Ezra Furman it's, and China Porter. Yeah, re- I was going to say just really good blurbs, yeah. isn't it, from Ezra Furman, the musician, and um, yeah, China Porter, the Seep. Seep, yeah. Which I love the Seep. That could, has, could have made up. Could have yeah, made it did as quite well, make it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I really recommend this one. I think. Yeah. Um, I haven't read a really great. Young adult novel Aww. this year. I've read a few, but um, I haven't loved loved them. Well, I hope this is it. Yeah. I feel like out of you know the majority of the books, this is perhaps the one I would recommend. Yeah. Um, feeling a bit more confidently that you'd like it, whereas yeah. some of the others are just a bit Specific. of an odd list. Yeah. <laughs> Next up for me is Gay Bar yeah. by Jeremy Afferton Lynn. I bloody read this one with uh, Wilma. Yay. from NB Reads. Um, it was such a good time. And I sort of partially listened to this on audio. I read the majority of it, but I listened to it while I was sort of cleaning at the school where I work at as well. And uh, so I get, got to hear his voice um, reading it, which is great as well. Um, this is kind of, yeah, a, a part biography, part celebration and history of um, gay bars um, in kind of London and New York specifically, and Hollywood, different places where he's lived. And, um, yeah, so part his experiences in these bars, part how they came about and the role they played, and part, I guess, questioning what their role is now in a, in a time where people are meeting each other more online, whilst in the past the gay bar's purpose would have been to find your, find your people, to hook up with people... Um, and to sort of celebrate who you were, um, he's sort of saying that that role is still really important um, and that we shouldn't, I guess, let it get completely taken over by uh, the internet. Um, but it's just really well written. Also a, a real sort of feeling of um, celebration and nostalgia for these uh, moments that only really happen in bars. Um, you know, this sort of this sort of split second where you feel seen or you feel moments of joy in other people's company, um, and yeah, I really love this, and I would recommend this to anyone. This is, I think, a book that most people would enjoy. Um, yeah, and why we went out. I'm going to read that one. I saw it's also on. I think it was on. Well, it's definitely on one of the staff members of Gaze the Words Top Five. Oh, yeah, I don't it know was, if it was lovely it? Jim, the manager, yeah, but um, yeah. definitely someone's. So I think lots of people have liked that this year, haven't they? Yeah, I've got a tag in it. Should we have a look what that is? Yeah. I can't remember. I read this one quite a while ago. Yeah, this is quite an interesting bit I've tagged. And it's all about that um, that feeling of, he's sort of saying that kids today, it turns out, want rules. And that feeling of safety, which goes once you're in this kind of environment oh, okay. of the bar. And how that was partially a bit of a draw at the time, that danger of it. Um, and so he writes, um, we did not go out to be safe. I didn't anyway. Um, I went out to take risks, I went out to be close to other bodies, perhaps that amounts to safety in numbers. It was more about being turned on in proximity. The idea of a safe space isn't coherent to me, but then again I now realise that I'm privileged in ways I didn't previously comprehend. The kids have told me. Um, so I think it's come, he comes from that generation yeah. where I guess it much was much more, I guess, nihilistic, um, hedonistic. Um, I like the kids have told me. Yeah, I like that, and he sort of, I guess, you know, he is also similar to Cooper Lee from my dear, and a bit of an elder. Um, what is he in his 40s? <laughs> yeah, but like, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that is the case, I guess, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Especially when, you know, so, my, so many of previous generations have been lost to AIDS and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just really great to read his experiences and I could really relate to it. I could really relate to his reasons for going out and for those moments that you go out for which I guess were few and far between, but it sort of kept you coming back for more. Um, I loved it. I really loved it. And yeah. Yay. Thanks for the buddy read, Will. <laughs> I'll be reading that next year as well. I've yeah. got loads in your list that I want to read. Yeah, that's good. 
Number five for me mm -hmm. is Rosemary's Baby by four. Ira Levin. I yeah. know, introduced by Chuck Palnick. I got this at the library and then loved it so much I bought it. Yeah. Um, this was a bit like just a really lovely experience of reading it in a day and then we watched the movie in the night. And even though I was saying about how it's interesting when movies and books are really different, the movie for this is almost exactly <laughs> the same. Like, yeah. word for word, yeah. um, little things like I noticed in the book, like she put something down on a book. Oh, yeah. In the film, it's exactly the same book that she's put something down on, you know, like, really exact. Yeah. Went into it not really expecting much because I'd read another book by her 11. I read... Um, What's the famous one? Did you read Stepford Wives? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't really I didn't really think much of that. I read Sliver. <laughs> that was really bad. Yeah. So I was just yeah. like, well, I'll, you know, I'll read yeah. it. But actually it was so stylish. It yeah. felt so kind of sixties. Yeah. In the sixties, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um it, you know, this couple moving into sixties. <laughs> this couple moving into this, you know, fancy apartment, the husband's like an actor, very kind of stylish. Yeah. There'd be like, you know, the talks of like the, all the little, um, you know, very materialistic as well, yeah. or materiality that of the, of of the York, time. Sort of um, slightly upper class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And it's amazing to sort of think about like the impact that it must have had at the time as well, something like this, because it then like influenced so much of cinema yeah. and other, other books and the yeah. whole culture, really, didn't it? Yeah. Amazing. Um, Truman Capote says it's a darkly brilliant tale of modern devilry. I don't know if I was like the only person in the world, but I didn't know what the plot was at first. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I had no possibly idea. Possibly you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had no idea what was yeah. going on. Um, uh, also, I'd say like, you know, it's horror, I guess, but it, it's not, I, we have, yeah, I'm always like, about what is horror or not. Yeah. But it, I just it's think. Horror. It's horror. I don't know if that passes. That's spoiling it. It's not spoiling it. It's not spoiling it. <laughs> I didn't know. Right? Okay. <laughs> So it's, I was going to say it's horror. I just think that some people might be put off by horror, yeah. but it's just like not scary at all. Yeah, it's, I just think it's very, but it felt like that kind of story of sort of, you know, that modern manners type. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Morality. Kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Loved it. I thought it was great. Number, oh, we're in the number four. Oh my God. It's getting close. Um, Shucky Bane by Douglas Stewart. I'm so excited about his new book, by the way. It looks great, doesn't mm. it? Um, yeah, I guess you don't really need to hear my take on this book. It just um, Also, I've already talked about it quite a bit, but I was just really, really moved by it. I thought the writing was absolutely brilliant. I thought he really captured that sort of feeling of uh, working class sort of culture really well. And they're both brilliant character studies. Um, you kind of really care for both characters. Um, the mother in particular, I felt, was just absolutely the one of those unforgettable characters in literature. And, uh, yeah, what can you say? It says beautiful and brutal. It is. I just feel like this is the kind of novel that I really love. Um, I, I don't want to read it. No. <laughs> I think Know Your Limits, isn't know it? Know Your Limits. Know Your yeah, Limits. Yeah. Number four for me. So this is one that led on from the Mariana and Rikas. Um, when I was doing my deep dive, mm. I found an interview between, or a conversation between Mariana and Rikas and Guadalupe Neto. And it was, Gradle Panetta was so great. They were both so great. I thought, I'll buy one of her books. And this is it. So this is um, After the Winter. Translated from the Spanish from Rosalind Harvey. Um, Gradle Panetta is Mexican. It, it's quite a slow kind of literary fiction type, work, type book. Um, but, I, and I wasn't sure why I really liked it so much, but I, I really... You really hated the character in it, didn't oh, you? Oh, it's got like, so it's like <laughs> mainly between two characters. Um, one is like a, a girl who's a student in Paris, but from Mexico. And then the other, and she lives opposite a graveyard and, kind of, and she's kind of a bit depressed in Paris. And then the other one is Claudio, um, who's a guy who lives in New York. Um, I can't remember where he's from, but he's not from New York either. Um, and he's like so obnoxious. Like, I, <laughs> I can't remember, like, mm. hating a character. Not hating, mm. but... Because he felt, feels really believable as yeah. well, but he's just horrendous. And then there's a bit where the stories kind of intercept, and you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It also it gets, like, wild at the end there. Yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, like, when you're in the book and you don't really mind where it goes, you're just like, fine. Yeah. Because <laughs> it doesn't go into fantasy. That's what you hate, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. I do struggle with yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> that 
or it just, I just feel like somehow I need to be taken along. Yeah. I was taken along in this. You know, a lot of it's set in Paris. Yeah. I had this week, she's there, you know, um, struggling in Paris and it's really cold and um, she doesn't really... That in itself is everything I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Struggling in Paris. Yeah. yeah. I've really loved it. Yeah. 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 Great writing. Definitely going to read more. Yeah. Great characters, one of whom is awful. So... Uh, number three for me is um, it's a book for, called The Lice by W. S. Merwin. I'll put up like the original kind of cover uh, there, but I read it as part of this um, four volumes in one um, collection of W. S. Merwin's. Um, so The Lice was his collection from 1967, and it's really the collection where he finds his style um i think and um, i feel like in this collection he he which he i think he himself sort of said he it was a really low point uh, for him and i guess in society there's like you know loads of turmoil and he felt like he didn't really want to write so this book just came out um lawrence lieberman um wrote of the lice if there is any book today that has captured the peculiar spiritual agony of our time the agony of a generation which knows itself to be the last and has transformed that agony into great art. It is W. S. Merwin's *The Lice*, and I feel like that is um, a kind of relatable moment as well because I, there's that very much that feeling now, uh, you know, of this generation feeling like it's the last of all the sort of climate anxiety. And um, at the time, then it was you know the, the bomb and or Vietnam and uh, all the uprisings. Um, and whilst these aren't um, obviously or directly political poems, they they feel very um, internal um, and spiritual there's a real sort of sense of the time somehow through that and I'm not sure how he does that but I've tagged a, a line which I like which I guess will give you a bit of a sense because they are quite obtuse poems so they don't always make a lot of sense but something about the the wording and like the order of the language um, just sort of does that thing which I like in poetry sort of slightly sort of um, puts you on a different track about how you think about words um, and this is from December night just kind of December. Mm -hmm. um, I hear magpies kept awake by the moon the water flows through its own fingers without end um, so there's a real kind of almost like Buddhist Zen kind mm. of type feel to it I guess you know you could maybe compare them to like Gary Snyder type things um, although they're much less practical chopping wood yeah than Gary Snyder there's much less about the external world um, other than sort of nature, but not much about him hiking mm. or making tea. Or <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but I loved the lice. I felt it was a life-changing collection. I loved the W.S. Merwin. Um, yeah, and that's a book that I'll, I, I think, for my own practice, will keep going back to to learn more from. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So number three for me. It's a weird one. It really is. <laughs> It's Downdrift by Joanna Drucker. So I hadn't heard of this one. It was the only reason I'd seen about it was because it was one of the choices for the climate fiction book group, which is um, run by Sage, uh, Sim and Wilma. I'm pretty sure this was Wilma's choice. They read um, cli-fi books or climate fiction yeah. books. Um, and this is actually called Downdrift, an eco-fiction in yeah. its title. So I only bought that because of that, because I wanted to, you know, be a part of the discussion. Um, and then I started reading it and I was like, what is this? <laughs> um, I kind of wanted a DNF, yeah. but I didn't because I bought it. So if I got in the library, I would have DNF'd it. Yeah. So I didn't DNF because I bought it and because the um, the book group was, you know, they, it's obviously online, but they were kind of discussing it in a few days' time. So I like, kept mm. going. Um, it's sort of plotless. It's like about uh, a cat and a lion and they're kind of wandering the world and there's been an, what people are calling an updrift, which is animals taking on um, um, things from humans, um, but which the, an, the cat and the lion are thinking of as a downdrift. It's not like a positive to become more human. Yeah. It's actually a negative. Um, and that is the plot. <laughs> it's the most plotless book I've ever read. Um, and it just goes on about these cat, this cat and the lion. The cat, it's kind of from their point of view and from a an Archean, hmm. a 3.8 billion year old species. And um, 
it's just describing all the animals and what they're doing as they walk around the world. So for instance, this is about rats. Stylishly attired, the rats stay up all night in their clubs, banging out the worst kind of crooning lounge music. The sight of those rodent hips in a slow swivel around a long drawn out note of lo low toned vulgar music is enough to send the squirrels and mice into convulsions of laughter. But the non-stop clamour keeps the rest of the animals from sleeping. They pray for a change in rat styles and tastes. In the morning, the mice launch a whole new line of athletic gear as competition. The ski slopes are calling and pretty soon they're scunning their cunning little skis will steal the show on the snow. So it's like funny mm. and ridiculous and it's just like that the whole way through. Yeah, for how many pages? <laughs> for like um, 285 pages. But at some point it becomes like hypnotic. So you just kind of have to keep reading and at some point it's, all, it's like, for me, it felt really profound. Mm -hmm. Nothing particular changes. Yeah. But there's that that repetitiveness of it yeah. became something else and I was really moved by it and um, the the writer I don't know if she's written any other novels but she's primarily like a graphic designer um, she says that her work she's internationally known uh, in the history of graphic design typography experimental poetry fine art and digital humanities um, and she teaches you know she she still teaches now she's got an honorary doctorate in fine arts and I feel like that is it feels to me more like a kind of almost like an art piece yeah rather than a, yeah. a novel it's, yeah. it doesn't follow traditional storytelling no. skills it mm -hmm. felt like it was something completely different yeah. and also so, there's like so cute loads of cute things in it like squirrels knitting <laughs> but then it's also like obviously is about yeah you know, climate change and yeah. the awfulness of all yeah. of this. So, yeah. what's number two? Number two is um, that old country music by Kevin Yay. Barry. Kevin Barry's um, one of my favourite, favourite, favourite writers in the world right now. Uh, so, I've read quite a few of his previous books. So this is a short story collection, which you'd never think a short story collection would make my top ten. Same as you, really. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not. I don't know. We're not big you read more than me, so yeah. we don't read loads. Because I think it's really difficult to have that sort of sustained yeah. quality. But this, I loved every single story in it. Um, yeah, it's just he's just a really brilliant writer. Like he's got a real romantic, uh, tongue-in-cheek, um, almost kind of baroque uh, Irish lilt to his writing, and it's real kind of you know that classic, um, almost like a verbal storyteller kind of feel to it. Um, and these are sort of stories all set around the uh, west of Ireland, um, it says. Um, and I love them. I, I do think the... So I listened to this on audio and I've since bought it. The audio was amazing because he reads it himself and I just think that really adds to the flavour of it. And um, yeah, the, the first short story in here is probably my favourite one and that's um, uh, The Coast of Leitrim. Um but looking at the titles here, they're all—I remember them all being great. And there's a real sort of there's, there's a real sort of sadness to it as well. There's um, a bit of a darkness to it. So it, there, whilst there's quite a lot of humour in, in in it, especially in the writing, um, there's that whole kind of happy sad thing. There's a real sort of no, the light and the dark, and there's lots of dark in it as well. Um, the one one that sort of I remember the the most vividly is um, Who's Dead McCarthy, which is about this character. I was always telling you who's died recently in the village or whatever um so yeah it's just kind of a story about that and this guy sort of narrating it sort of going through his kind of life but every now and again who's dead mccarthy will come <laughs> over and tell tell him do you, you heard who's died next kind of thing. and um it's about how that kind of really gets the, the narrator thinking about death all the time um he just comes really sort of hyper aware of it um but my favorite bit in that story was um uh, another day creeping up behind me with a light touch on my elbow and then the lean in, the soft whisper and here was news of the famous dead Zsa Zsa Gabor, he said <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. yeah, it's just great it's sort of, yeah, brilliant writing and um, style wise I think my favourite writer at the moment um, Kevin Barry also Heather um, let me know about that on Borrow Box I think because she listened to it first and I think she really liked it too well, I know she really liked it too. Heather's saying it was like some guy, some older guy at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> it's like stories. some slightly sort of drunk guy yeah. telling you a story. 
Um, but it's not really sort of, you know, when someone's a really good storyteller, it sort of just like gets you in somehow. Uh, number two for me is The Cypher by Kathy Koja. Whoa. Whoa. Read this at the beginning of the year, heard about it from Alex at Bookkeepers. This is a reissue, which I think was quite recently reissued because it's originally from the 90s. And her other books are not available, other than the short stories, which I didn't care yeah, for. Yeah. So this, um, yeah, it was republished in 2020, but it was originally uh, written and published in 1991. Um, it's horror. This is another person that I was just like watching interviews with. I was like completely in love with Kathy yeah. Coach after this. She's so great, isn't she? Yeah. We watched interviews with her. So. Yeah, she's I hope amazing. Maybe reissue some more stuff this year. Oh, I really want to read yeah. some other ones because they're quite so. And there's lots of bad artists and they're quite arty as well. They kind of got that real kind of feel of nineties grungy arty music kind of yeah. feel to them. This was so odd. I I loved it. I loved the writing. I'm not sure if it like a hundred percent works in the story like I feel it maybe the ending isn't as strong as the rest of it and I but also it's kind of that thing of it's more about the atmosphere and the yeah. strangeness of it so it didn't bother me that much but yeah I could see how it would yeah. um it's about this guy and his sort of girlfriend who discover this kind of hole in a in like a room in in flats that they live in so it's not in his flat it's like in a kind of storeroom they find this hole and if you put stuff down the hole they kind of come back changed mm -hmm. um and then he starts to kind of experiment with putting stuff down this kind of big hole um it's just so weird it just feels so, so 90s those, sort of, those early 90s or i think the early 90s is kind of a time that's a bit sort of forgotten that sort of post 80s where it was all like glamour and and everyone was really happy and optimistic and like the early nineties was like just really grim it's and gr dark yeah. and yeah. Um, slightly sort of debauched feel, wasn't yeah. it? I feel like and yeah, like grunge. It has that debauched. Set. It has that kind of he he's like man works in a video store. Yeah. Um. So it's very much that kind of you know crappy jobs. Yeah. And then just getting really drinking yeah. loads. There so was that drugs. sort of massive nihilism around at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This bit at the back which is a, a quote about this hole that's materialised. It says, black, pure black, and the sense of pulsation, especially when you look at it too closely, the sense of something not living but alive. Um, what's the favourite book, book, book? book of the year, Bert? Yeah, what is the favourite book of the year, Obviously, the yeah, book that everyone yeah. else was reading this oh year. Oh, my God! It's on everyone's list. They Shoot Horses, Don't They, by Horace McCoy. Yeah, you're not like other boys. <laughs> I try to be, but what can you do? Here's Horace. Um, what an icon he was. This is from 1935. Um, but don't be taken in by that. This is um, about as gritty as it comes. So it's know. not like the Gilmore Girls episode, they shoot Gilmore's. Don't, don't think, they? don't think, it's about a dance marathon. <laughs> just to that up. Um, it's about a dance marathon, which was, you know, a big... Um, social thing um back at the time a bit of a phenomena where often poor people would enter these competitions to win money and to possibly be spotted by celebrities or you know studios and stuff in hollywood um to become actors and things like that um and they were horrendous um there was like yeah so it was 24 hours dancing but these things went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and you would have hardly any sleep you'd have 10 minute breaks every few hours um hardly any food and it was just an endurance test um that people you know watched as entertainment even though people were like you know basically t killing themselves <laughs> um so yeah um that aspect of it in itself is fascinating to read about um but he sort of weaves the story of this sort of um couple that enter they're not really a couple it's kind of a guy and he meets a girl and they get to know each other and then they decide to enter this because they want because they want money. Um, but in that you get you know uh, adultery, um, abortion, incest. Everything is in this book. Really dark, um, immaculately written. I just felt like the writing is that kind of noir style at its peak. Like it's so concise and simple and powerful. Uh, yeah, it's just you know how like those old noir films sometimes were just felt incredibly dark compared to like dark stuff now which is often more just violent 
these these yeah. things felt like really sort of um, psychologically coming from a really dark place and yeah. um yeah and this book is just like the epitome of that feeling um i just thought it was perfection because it's a small book so i think it does require that reading in like a couple of sittings because it feels like you're there in this like really claustrophobic moment this sort of dance dance um and it says um simone de beauvoir said it was the first existentialist novel to have appeared in america and you can see that that sort of real sense of um hopelessness yeah. been in print ever since it came out oh, that's interesting. 1935 yeah. and there was a film which we still haven't seen with no. jane fonda i think <gasps> oh, my book of the year yes they shoot horses don't they yeah what's number one johnny yay <laughs> <laughs> detransition baby. De baby tory peter <laughs> loved it Read it with Charlotte at uh, Bookish Mama Blooms. Charlotte didn't like it as much as I did. Chassa. <laughs> she loves being called Chassa. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and this is what I think. I, I gave it four stars because, you know, I don't think, again, sort of like Cypher, I don't think it, for me, more plot-wise, didn't 100% work, maybe. Yeah. Um, but the writing is amazing. And the characters are amazing. The feel of it, yeah. And I think for me as well is that I just kept thinking about it afterwards um, and I got obsessed with Soy Peters. <laughs> um, I, and I listened to this great podcast with Tori Peters um, where she talks about uh, my struggle with Klausgaard and how, my, how she's obsessed with Klausgaard, which really made sense in the with this book then and she talks about how bits from she read Knauskar to help her write some of the bits which I thought was really interesting um anyway she talked about how much she loves him in this in this uh in this podcast and then at some point on Instagram she's like getting her hair done because she gets to go and interview Knauskar <laughs> I was like yay I know this is not telling you anything about the book it's great Tori's great. Number one. Number one. So when Tori Peets puts on Instagram, like stuff like she was on the Goodreads, you know, when you had to vote for your Goodreads favourite book, oh, yeah. she was like, my Goodreads fav my book is on Goodreads, can you vote for it? So I'm like, I voted Tori. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, a DM. And yeah. she, she replies. Yeah. She's delightful. Nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did the same with Horace McCoy. Did but you? Not, like, <laughs> that. Is she yeah. on Instagram? Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Whoa, what good list. Well done, us. Yeah, yeah. we did great. Yeah. Really, didn't we? <laughs> um, we're going to do a even more exciting video, because I think top tens are quite exciting. I yeah. think we agree. But um, there's lots of books that we want to talk about that were more like, what books have we read in this genre that are worth recommending or that have been, been highlights and stuff like that? So we're going to do another video of like, you know, Favourite young uh, YA, uh, favourite graphic novels, favourite poetry. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I think is a bit more of an overview of our reading. Yeah. Um, this just feels like a very, yeah, it's just like it's such a small amount of stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Out of yeah. 100 books, whatever. If you see another video and we're wearing the same outfits, it's because we're just about to do it. <laughs> or if I'm still wearing this shirt, <laughs> just pretend. <laughs> and it's another day. Uh, Bye. Is that an hour? Yes! <laughs> <laughs>